So hi folks, welcome back to Widow's Astro Forum. My name is Widow Oermans. Choosing a dedicated astrophotography camera can be quite overwhelming. So in this video, I'll try to explain what kind of camera specifications are important when you are searching for your dedicated astrophotography camera. Let's go! I first started to photograph with a DSLR camera, but after some time I wanted to upgrade to a dedicated astrophotography camera to see if that would improve the quality of my pictures. And honestly, it really, really did. However, the process of choosing a camera can be mind boggling as there are so many things to take into account. So that's why I've decided to make two videos about astro cameras. In this first video, I'll talk about the fundamental differences between moon and planetary imaging on the one hand versus deep sky astrophotography on the other hand and how this relates to the specifications you want to look for when searching for a dedicated astrophotography camera. In next week's video I'm going to apply all the camera specifications I talk about today to real world cameras that are available in 2022 and I'll try to make some sense out of the many dedicated astrophotography cameras that are available today. If you have any questions or remarks, don't hesitate to put them in the comment section below. And let's go! So let's talk about planetary imaging first. Most people start their astrophotography hobby by looking at the moon and the planets in our very own solar system. And at one point you probably want to photograph them. Now technically this is not astrophotography as astro means star, so most people talk about moon and planetary imaging. Now if your plan is to start with planetary imaging you'll need to know that the planets are among the smallest but also the brightest objects in the night sky as they are illuminated by our own sun. Now one of the best ways to capture the moon and the planets is by taking short videos, often only one or two minutes long. Now, planetary imagers, they end up with many video frames of a planet which can be stacked and processed further to create a nice final picture of a planet. Now, because the planets are so tiny, you'll also need a long focal length telescope to properly magnify these planets in the sky. In this video, I'll focus on cameras, but on my website astroforumspace.com you can find more information on telescopes, cameras and also other gear you're going to need when getting into planetary imaging or deep sky astrophotography. So deep sky astrophotography is very different from planetary imaging. Deep sky astrophotography is all about capturing the light from objects that are far beyond our own solar system, often hundreds, thousands or sometimes even millions of light years away. Now, as a consequence, the light you're trying to capture is very faint. And here lies the main challenge for deep sky astrophotography. You'll have to take multi-minute exposures of deep sky objects like nebulas, star clusters or galaxies to capture that faint and very old light from deep space. Now, in order to do just that, you'll not only need a high quality camera to take long exposure pictures, but also other gear like high quality equatorial mounts that can track the movement of the objects in the night sky due to the rotation of the Earth. Now again, in this video I'll stick to discussing cameras, but if you're interested in gear needed to start deep sky astrophotography, you can check out my website astroformspace.com. Now, astrophotographers also take multiple pictures of the same object in space and this often results in many hours or even days of data. In astrophotography, data refers to both the quantity and the exposure time of all the pictures you took of a single object in space. Now these images are then stacked and further processed to create a final image of a deep, deep sky object. Now it goes beyond the video to explain these processing techniques, but you can find that info on my website if you're interested. So now that you know that deep sky astrophotography is all about taking long exposure pictures and planetary imaging is all about taking short exposure pictures, you probably also understand that the specifications of a good camera are not the same for deep sky astrophotography versus planetary imaging. So let's discuss which specifications to look for when either looking for a planetary or a deep sky astrophotography camera. So 
So let's start with resolution and pixel size. Now let me try to explain as clearly as I can how resolution and pixel size play a role in astrophotography. But I have to warn you, this is going to take a while. Resolution refers to the size of the digital image that the camera produces and is usually expressed in terms of the number of pixels the camera holds. Now the more pixels the sensor of your camera has, the larger the field of view you will be getting when imaging objects in space. Now this is nice because large deep sky objects like for instance the Andromeda Galaxy will fit in the field of view of your camera. Now this is not the whole story though. The exact field of view you will be getting does not only depend on the resolution of the camera, but also on the pixel size of the camera and the focal length of the telescope or lens you're going to use when imaging the night sky. Now this is often referred to as the imaging scale and can be calculated by using the formula pixel size divided by the focal length of your telescope times 206.265. Now the imaging scale relates to the amount of sky you're going to cover with each pixel of your camera and is often expressed in arc seconds per pixel. Okay, this sounds a bit abstract, so let me try to point out how this works in practice. An arc second is equal to 1 hundredth of a degree. Do you remember that geo triangle from your math class? Do you see that first stripe indicating one degree? Now divide that by 3600 and that's one arc second. For example, the moon at roughly 384,000 kilometers already covers 2040 arc seconds in width and height. And one of the most popular and largest objects photographed by astrophotographers, the Andromeda galaxy at about two and a half million light years from Earth, covers an amazing three degrees in width and one degree in height. So that's actually 10,800 by 3,600 arc seconds. So if your camera and telescope combination would exactly cover one arc second for each pixel, you'd need a sensor of at least 10,800 by 3,600 pixels to capture our neighboring galaxy in one picture without any room to spare. Now, if your imaging scale is 2 arc seconds per pixel, you'd need at least a sensor of 5000 by 2000 pixels. Wow, are you still here? I hope so. Now, if you are, let me then also explain why an ideal imaging scale for deep sky astrophotography is a camera and telescope combination that gives you somewhere in between 1 and 2 arc seconds per pixel. Now, an imaging scale higher than 2 arc seconds per pixel will lead to what is called under sampling, whereas an imaging scale of less than one arc second per pixel often leads to over sampling. Now this is, this is pretty easy to understand. Your camera consists of super tiny square pixels and you need at least six or nine of those pixels to produce a round shape like a star. Now under sampling means that your imaging scale is such that most stars will cover only one to six pixels and you can produce a round shape with that amount of pixels, so your stars will look rather blocky in your image. Now this is called undersampling. On the other hand, if your imaging scale is below one arc second per pixel, you often end up with big bloated stars covering many pixels in your image. In addition, the astronomical seeing for most locations on Earth is about one arc second or higher due to the atmospheric turbulence caused by the turbulent airflows in the Earth's atmosphere. This is why most professional telescopes are built on mountaintops. The less air you have, the better your astronomical seeing is. Now there are some tricks to deal with oversampling like binning and drizzling to deal with undersampling. But it would be best to already take the imaging scale into account when searching for a good camera. So let me also discuss imaging scale in relation to planetary imaging as this works out quite differently. Now, as already mentioned, the planets are tiny objects in the night sky and now that you know more about imaging scale and arc seconds, let me tell you that the biggest planet in our solar system, Jupiter, only covers about 51 arc seconds and that is when Jupiter is in opposition. Now, In opposition means that the planet is at its closest point to Earth in its orbit around the Sun. Now, Venus covers about 61 arc seconds as one of our neighboring planets, Mars only 25 arc seconds and Saturn 21 arc seconds. Now, You probably noticed that I haven't mentioned Neptune and Uranus yet. I suggest you google those planets with arc seconds added and 
then you probably know why no amateur has come up with a decent picture of those planets. So let's assume that your imaging scale is one arc second per pixel. Now, you don't have to be Einstein to realize that Jupiter will only cover 51 pixels of your camera. Venus 61, Mars 25, Saturn 21, uh, even at the best of times. So, what does that mean when talking about resolution and imaging scale? Well, it means that even a tiny 1 megapixel camera sensor, which refers to a camera that has 1200 by 900 pixels, can easily capture these planets, or even when these planets are captured at an imaging scale uh, of 1 fourth or even 1 tenth of an arc second per pixel, these planets would still fit in the field of view of a tiny 1 megapixel camera. So, that is good news as tinier sensors relate to cheaper cameras. So most experienced planetary photographers are indeed imaging at sub arc second imaging scales with long focal length telescopes. So what about the astronomical seeing, you, you could ask? Doesn't astronomical seeing limit the imaging scale when capturing the planets? Well, yes, but planetary images argue that they can beat the general astronomical seeing conditions as they engage in something that is called lucky imaging. Now often astrophotographers take very short videos of the planets at a high frame rate per second or FPS. So let's talk about that. Frame rate per second or FPS in short is only important for planetary imaging. FPS refers to the number of images your camera can take for every second of video. Now, lots of Hollywood movies have a standard of uh, 24 frames per second. There are some exceptions with some movies being shot as high as 120 FPS to get smooth slow motion scenes. So what does FPS mean for planetary imaging? Well, quite simple. The higher your FPS, the more images per second you can take. Now, for example, a camera with 25 FPS takes 1500 pictures in one minute, whereas a camera at 50 FPS takes 3000 frames per minute. Now, having twice as many frames increases your options to select and stack only the highest quality frames. Now, if you get lucky, for instance, and you have 10 seconds of good astronomical seeing during a one minute video, an FPS of 50 will get you 500 high quality frames of the planet, whereas an FPS of 100 will get you 1000 frames. Now, even if the astronomical seeing is rather stable during the entire video, more images are still preferred as you will be able to stack up to two times as many images to produce a final image which increases your signal to noise ratio. Now for deep sky astrophotography, FPS is not important whatsoever because you're going to take long exposure pictures of dim objects in deep space. So most dedicated deep sky astrophotography cameras have a cooling system designed to cool the camera sensor down to below freezing temperatures. Now the reason for this is that heat tends to build up in your CMOS sensor when taking long exposure pictures of a deep sky object. Now this build up of heat results in dark current noise in your picture, where unwanted electrons are visible in your image that are independent from the light falling onto your sensor. A cooling system on your camera will keep the unwanted dark noise to a minimum. Now, most camera cooling systems drop dark current in half for every 5 degrees they are cooled, so it makes sense to cool the camera sensor down as much as possible. This is why most deep sky astrophotography cameras have a thermoelectric cooler which can cool the camera down to about minus 35 degrees below ambient temperature. Now, I do have to note that cooling is not required for deep sky astrophotography. Many people have a DSLR camera and some tricks to avoid the dark current noise without cooling are to dither between images and subtract, subtract dark frames that match the exposure time and temperature of your light frames. Now, I will not go into the technical details of this, uh, that's for another video. In my honest opinion, however, it's preferable to have a camera with a cooler for deep sky astrophotography as it keeps the dark current noise to a minimum, which is always better than trying to get rid of the noise when you already took your deep sky astrophotography pictures. So for planetary imaging, however, the benefits of a cooling system is negligible. Even though the camera sensor can become quite warm when taking videos at a high frame rate per second, the exposures are so short that dark current doesn't have the time to build up in each of the frames.
For both planetary and deep sky astrophotography, selecting a mono or a color camera is a rather personal choice. Both have their pros and cons. The main advantage of a color camera is that your camera is able to produce a color image of the night sky without the additional complexity that goes into using a mono camera. So the million dollar question is, why do many experienced astrophotographers prefer a mono over a color camera? Well, I have a separate blog and separate videos about this on my website, but basically it comes down to this. Every color camera has a Bayer matrix in front of the camera sensor. Now that Bayer matrix consists of super tiny filters in the colors red, green and blue that are placed in front of every pixel. 50% of the Bayer matrix consists of green filters, whereas 25% consists of red and 25% consists of blue filters. This RGGB pattern, as it is called, is oversampling green and undersampling red and blue to mimic our human physiology, as we as humans are more sensitive to detecting green light and we want our pictures to match what we see with the naked eye in real life. Now unfortunately, when a photon in the red or blue part of the visible light spectrum hits a green filter, it will be rejected. And vice versa, if a green photon hits a blue or a red filter, it will also be rejected. Now, this is of no concern for daytime photography, but in astrophotography, we want to collect every precious ancient photon of light. So let's talk about shooting in mono. This has several advantages. First of all, there's no Bayer filter, so we can just shoot the night sky in black and white without using any filter, which is called shooting luminance frames. Now, the absence of a filter makes it so that most photons will be registered on the camera sensor, regardless of their color, which creates a highly dynamic black and white picture of objects in space. Also, you can use red, green and blue broadband filters to collect light from those specific parts of the light spectrum and combine them to create a natural looking color image with a mono camera. Finally, you can also use specific narrowband filters to only catch very specific parts of the light spectrum that correspond with ionized hydrogen or oxygen, often found in nebulas that emit light at very specific bandwidths. So the main disadvantage of monochrome imaging is that you do need additional filters and some device that holds your filters in front of the sensor of your mono camera, like a filter wheel. It also takes more time to collect the light using different filters and the process of creating a final picture from your images is also more complex. But in the end you do get higher quality astrophotography pictures, which is why folks are willing to spend the extra effort. Now this is true for deep sky astrophotography as well as planetary imaging. So read noise refers to the noise of your camera's electronics. As each pixel value is being read out, a few extra electrons are lost or gained randomly causing the readout value to vary a little bit from the actual captured signal. Now, read noise has the most impact on faint signals. So read noise is especially important for deep sky astrophotography as we are trying to capture faint light from deep sky objects. Now, unlike other noise sources like dark current noise, Read noise is independent of things like the exposure time or cooling. This means uh, you get a similar amount of read noise whether you have a short or long exposure time or whether you are using cooling or not. The best weapon against read noise as well as other types of noise is actually to increase your exposure time. Because the noise increases only with the square root of the signal. So with longer exposure times the weak photons from your deep sky object have a higher chance to get above the noise level of your camera. Now, other than increasing the exposure time, your best bet is to get a higher quality camera that produces less read noise in the first place. Now, the dynamic range of your camera depends on the analog to digital converter or ADC in your camera. Now let's start with the lowest number your analog to digital converter can have, and that would be one bit. One bit simply means that your camera is able to create two variations, zero being black and one being white. Now with every step increase in bit, the ability to produce variations from black to white increases by the power two. So a two bit ADC can produce two times two is four variations. A four bit ADC can produce two times two times two times two is 16 variations. 
Now the highest quality Deep Sky astrophotography cameras are currently 16-bit cameras. Uh, so they can produce 16 to the power 2 is 65,535 variations from black to white. So the more bits your ADC has, the more subtle the variations in tonal values it can produce. Now we call the large range of values uh, between black and white the dynamic range of, uh, of a camera. And the more dynamic range is always better when processing your images. So another aspect of dynamic range is the full well capacity of the pixels of your camera sensor. The full well capacity is the largest charge a pixel can hold before saturation, which results in a degradation of the signal. When the charge in a pixel exceeds the saturation level, the charge starts to fill adjacent pixels. And this process is also known as blooming. The camera also starts to deviate from the linear response and this will compromise the quantitative performance of the camera. So the main takeaway from all this is that a higher bit ADC and a higher full well capacity will result in a higher dynamic range, which is what you want in your astrophotography pictures. Wow, this was quite a video and I hope you are still here. Let me give you a quick rundown of what we discussed. First, I told you that planetary imaging is mainly about short exposure pictures of the planets in our solar system. Whereas deep sky astrophotography is mainly about taking long exposure pictures to catch the faint light from deep sky objects. Now, for planetary imaging, even sensors that only have a low resolution, for instance one megapixel resolution, are good enough to capture the planets as they are very tiny objects in the night sky. Also, a high frame rate per second, so a high FPS, is preferred as it will get you more pictures of the planets, but for instance a cooling system is not needed. Now, for deep sky astrophotography you want a high resolution camera because you can uh, catch large objects in deep space in just one frame and you want a cooler to keep the dark noise current to a minimum whereas FPS or frame rate per second is not important as all, at all as you're going to take long exposure pictures. Now for both types of imaging a color camera is much easier to use whereas a mono camera will ultimately produce a higher quality image and you generally, generally want to look for cameras with a low read noise, a high quantum efficiency, so a high bit analog to digital converter and a high full well capacity. So I hope you didn't fall asleep. Uh, I will release another video next week where I'll attempt to compare the many astro cameras that are available on the market today to the specifications I discussed in this video. Now, if you're interested, you're welcome to subscribe to the channel and I hope to see you again in one of my other videos. Clear skies!